I think uh, we could probably begin. On behalf of the Committee on Lectures, the Psychology Department, Sociology Department, a Family Environment, and the Psych Club and the Graduate College who are sponsoring this lecture, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Elaine Hatfield from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Hatfield received her PhD degree from Stanford University, and before coming to Madison, she has taught at the University of Ro Rochester and the University of Minnesota. And she has been at the University of Wisconsin at Madison for around 10 years. Tonight, Dr. Hatfield is going to talk about some of her research, uh, which comes from a book called A New Look at Love. She is internationally known primarily for her research on equity, which she talked about this afternoon, and also her work on interpersonal attraction. So without any further introduction, I'd like to introduce a good colleague and good friend, Elaine Hatfield. I'll be talking about in a new look at love today. Um, this is the first time I've ever tried to talk about popular applications of social, social psychology, uh, and that's really sort of fun. This is not something that normally I ever would have done. Um, how this all came about was about three years ago, I guess, our state senator started criticizing researchers that were doing research on love and sex. Um, and so he attacked some research done at the University of Michigan on contraceptive use among women, and then there was a study that was, was stopped in Illinois um, to see what effect marijuana smoking had on sexual arousal uh, and then later sexual performance, and then Kelly's work on intimacy and families, um, Premax's work, uh, Prebrim's work with chimps, um, Deutsch's work on intimacy in the family. Well, finally, after all of this, he got around to my colleague at Minnesota, Ellen Bershide, uh, and I. Um, and there was an article that appeared that said, I object to this research not only because no one, not even the National Science Foundation, can argue that falling in love is a science, not only because I'm sure that even if they spent 84 million or 84 billion, they wouldn't get an answer anyone would believe. I'm also against it because I don't want the answer. I believe that 200 million other Americans want to leave some things in life a mystery. And right on top of the things we don't want to know is why a man falls in love with a woman and vice versa. So National Science Foundation, get out of the love racket. Leave that to Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Irving Berlin. Here, if anywhere, Alexander Pope was right when he observed, if ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. Well, because there's not so much to do in Wisconsin in the winter, there was sort of <laughs> this storm of fuss about this. So there was a lot of cartoons. I brought one tonight. Can you show the first one? Uh, it says, ignorance is bliss. That'll be five cents, please. It's from the, the uh, Snoopy series. But there were cartoons, and there were these awful interviews that appeared in the paper. They'd have caricatures of Proxmire and me, and they would describe my research. And then they would take a vote on, should this be done? And they always decided, no, it shouldn't be done. I lost every poll 86 to 1. It was just a disaster. Um, and then all the newspapers were around, like Haldeman and Ehrlichman, and I, I would try to explain what social psychology had to say that was relevant uh, to, to the world. And it turns out I just did a terrible job, uh, and that was really hard. Well, I guess it's um, the case. Ed Borgata once said he got to be a sociologist because on aptitude tests, he scored really high on everything except sociology. And he decided that that was an area where he really needed work, so he went into the area and, and ended up getting his degree. Well, it was so frustrating to be so inarticulate and not to be able to explain well what theoretical social psychologists knew that they could say to people in general that I sort of kept working on this. At the same time, I started to get lots of letters from people and phone calls from people with terrible emotional problems. 
uh, he's, Proxmire said he didn't want to know the answer, but clearly these hordes of people did want to know answers. And so I got all these letters from people, and you could sort of sort them into piles as to what their problem was, what their question was. A lot of the time, social psychology had nothing to say, but some of the time, uh, social psychologists did know more than uh, sort of the man in the street. And so that's how this book came about. The, you can show my second slide. I only have three. I'm working on accumulating some. Um, the book came about because what we decided to do uh, is to write down the most common questions we got, whether we could answer them or not, then review all the existing literature in social psychology to say, is there anything relevant on this topic? And then finally, to say, what kind of advice would most social psychologists give based on the information we have available? And so what we try and do in that is sort of have an encyclopedia of everything we know about love. Well, what I'm going to do tonight is tell you sort of a few of the findings that social psychologists uh, have come up with in the area of love. Um, and answer some of your, your questions. And then after about a half hour of this, you can just ask any questions about passionate or companionate love, and I'll see if I can retrieve any answers. Okay, let's start first by talking about what is love anyway. Um, it's really interesting to read the literature in that area because literally thousands of people have written definitions of love and they're all confident that they know the answer. Uh, I think the earliest definition of love that I found was Plato's, um, and he had a really marvelous idea. It's sort of wacko in a way, uh, but it's also so male chauvinistic, you'll really love it. Um, he thought that at one time people were joined together, and they had two heads, four arms, four legs, and they were a complete person. Um, then the gods got angry at men because they were arrogant and cut them in half, and so these half people wandered the earth evermore looking for their opposite half, and that's, that's why people have the feeling that they're sort of missing without someone else, that it takes someone else to be a complete person. So it was his contention that the best people in the world were homosexuals because they had once been a double man, and that was the best that you could be. And then there were males and females that went around, but those weren't normal, regular, everyday, common heterosexual um, couples. What they were were sort of women that were sex-crazed and adulterous, uh, and men that were kind of weak and unappealing. So that, that was that couple. Then he had women that were lesbians, but they weren't seen as strong. They were, the, they were sort of the most inferior category. That notion that people are missing without another half is around a lot. It's, it's a common theme in what love is. I was at an erotic art show, and they had several figures that were these kind of interlocking people. I got the most wholesome one for you. Can we have our last slide? Uh, uh, okay, that's a man and a woman. This erotic art show has every combination you can imagine. Dogs and cats and little kids and eight women and 12 men and just every permutation. But really the theme is the platonic kind of notion of people making up a complete whole together. The Freudians did a lot of speculating uh, about love and about the notion that people once had sort of total fulfillment and their idea of what it is that people are searching for when in the face of all evidence that people don't find complete fulfillment in love, we continue to believe that we could be totally happy if only somebody out there would cooperate, their notion was that we were once happy when we were in the womb, and they expand on that. Um, my favorite of the Freudians is, is Reich. He has a very nice book called The Psychologist Looks at Love. If you ever want to do some reading, it's not in a scientific form really, but it's great insights into the, the nature of love, so that's fun to read. 
Well, the approach that's most appealing to me uh, is a social psychological one. Um, and so in analyzing love, I really tried to put it into two categories. It seems like you can't handle it in one. You can talk about passionate love, sort of those intensely emotional, passionate, overwhelming kind of infatuation feelings. That seems to be one type of thing that, that people mean when they talk about love. The other is kind of companionate love, friendly, low-key, appreciation for a real person, not being in love with a daydream, but, but kind of a real person. I'll, I'm only going to talk about the first kind uh, of love tonight, intensely passionate love. And the theory that I like best that serves so far as kind of an organizing principle for everything we know about love is Schachter, Stanley Schachter's two-component theory um, of emotions. Now, Schachter is talking about every kind uh, of emotion, not just love. But let me first go through his general theory of love, and then we'll talk specifically about how it would apply to passionate love. Schachter argues that to have a true emotional experience, two things have to be in sync, mind and body. Um, you have to think that love or any other emotion is the appropriate label for what you're feeling, number one. And two, you have to feel something. Um, it's not enough just to feel you should be in love or you wish you were in love. You have to have a real physiological response. Um, now, Schachter takes the position, we don't have to take a, a position that strong, because it's wrong. Schachter takes the position that all emotions have exactly the same physiological base, that the only way we can tell excitement from depression, from anger, from abhorrence, from anything else, uh, is by the social situation, and that the emotions don't really feel different, you just think they feel different. That's probably wrong. It is probably the case that there's a lot in common between the emotions uh, and that we can slip very easily from one emotion to the other and it's easy to get them mixed up. But the best evidence around from physiologists suggests no, there are tiny differences between emotions. But when we're emotionally upset, it is very difficult to sit there and analytically detect those differences. We tend to move in and out from, from one emotion to the other. All right, um, Schachter then uh, would take the in, make the interesting argument that a whole lot of things could fuel emotion. Extremely good experiences, uh, things like daydreams, fantasy, excitement, security, having somebody understand you. But paradoxically, a lot of really terrible experiences could fuel passion too because it gets your adrenaline going. It makes you aroused. And so anxiety, stress, frustration, suffering of any kind sort of has you very aroused. And if you label those feelings as love, should increase passionate feelings. All right, well, let's take Schachter's general paradigm and see, can we organize the little bit that social psychologists know about passionate love and put it all together in, in a nice package? Uh, at this point, if anybody has any ideas or questions, you can just stop me. Uh, as we go along, we can have a discussion instead of a lecture. OK, let's start with, with the mind. Um, The first thing that, that we want to know then is it becomes really important if you think that your expectations about what you should be feeling affect what you do feel, it really becomes important to know what does this culture teach us about what love feels like. Uh, and it turns out that that's very interesting because our culture gives us a mixed message. Uh, people that have looked at the media and what families teach uh, and have just gone around and interviewed people, find that there's almost a 50-50 split 
About half of the people that are interviewed, college students that are interviewed, when you ask them what love feels like, say it feels great. Uh, you're happy. They assume somebody loves you back. It's fun, uh, excitement, and it's fulfilled love. That's sort of the 50% that think love is good. But about half the people, uh, either unaware that they have a different view of love than the other half, or, or knowing it but stuck with that definition, have a view of love as suffering. It's really the torch song kind of love. Um, and they assume that you love people who don't love you back, that if you feel guilt or pain or, or misery, that that's what love is about. And it's when they sort of have unpleasant feelings that they assume that they're loving someone. Some psychologists that have been interested in kind of finer definitions of, of love, uh, name as Lee, for example, a Canadian, who's done some research called The Colors of Love, find that it isn't surprising that it's hard for people to talk to each other about love because he found that people have remarkably different ideas. Uh, he decided that they had either six or nine ideas of love, depending on which factor analysis uh, uh, he did. Um, and that he found that people went all the way from thinking of love as kind of a practical thing, that you loved who it was practical to love, to a kind of love called mania, which was kind of this obsessive excitement, which is pretty much what I mean by passionate love. Um, Aesthetic love, loving people who just on sight look beautiful to you, whatever, whatever that is. And so psychologists now, social psychologists, if you're interested in that topic, have really done quite a lot to find out what people associate with love. And they find that different people have very different ideas about love um, and that this affects the kind of relationship that you get into because if you think of love as suffering, it isn't surprising that you tend to get mixed up with people that make you suffer. Uh, and you define that as, as a love setting. Um, there's also some research to find out what conditions cause people uh, to feel, feel love. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, one question I get quite a lot when I, people write in to me uh, is, who's the most capable of love? men or women? And usually the question doesn't come in such an uh, academic form as that. It's usually men are no good, they're incapable of love, all they like to do is work, uh, or the opposite. Uh, women only like guys with sports cars, they're, they're incapable of love. Um, so I looked up the research to find out whatever your definition of love, uh, assuming that it can be pleasure or pain, who is the most susceptible to falling in love. And it's interesting because this is an area where common sense doesn't match the data at all. Almost everybody that we've ever interviewed that we said, ask that question, think of women as sort of pushovers when it comes to love. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a male chauvinist or a feminist. Everybody seems to think that it's women that are capable of love. Some of the early writers, if we get back to uh, uh, Plato, for example, Plato said, of course, women are the only ones capable of love. They're obviously inferior to men, and the only way they can make up for their inferiority is by giving love. And men obviously couldn't love their inferiors, and so, so men don't love. Um, but interestingly enough, in our generation, Shulamith Firestone says the same thing. She says that men are just incapable of love. They're taught to work all the time. Uh, and so women are the experts on love, and men are the experts on work, and they sort of never get together. But all of the studies that exist say, oh, it's more ambiguous than that. The data are so ambiguous that in this area, you can believe what you want to believe. If you like the idea that men are the true romantics, there are three studies that say you're absolutely right. Um, there's some old time research that was done about 1934 by a man named Hobart, and he made up a romanticism scale. Uh, this scale was designed to tap sort of how romantic as opposed to practical your ideas are. 
And so he had questions about love triumphs over everything. It doesn't matter if you speak the same language. It doesn't matter if your parents hate her. Uh, if you really love one another, it'll be all right. Go ahead and get married. Uh, versus you really should pick somebody that can support you. Uh, Hard-headed, practical kinds of things. And in several studies, they found that men are the true romantics uh, on these scales, that they're, they're kind of willing to, to throw away everything and, and marry. Then there's some more recent research by Rubin. And he picked 500 couples in Boston and followed them from early dates until their relationship broke up. And every time they'd come in, he'd say, are you in love yet? Uh, or are you still in love? And what he found was that it was men that fell in love first, uh, that on the average, after four dates, they knew if they were in love <laughs> <laughs> or not, while women were very cautious. They waited to about six dates to, <laughs> to decide if they were in love or not. Um, he also found that it was men that just couldn't give up when a relationship was over, that when everybody agreed that it was probably hopeless from the outside, men were still thinking that they could do something to keep this relationship they wanted, um, while women had given up. Some of the feminists interpreted this literature as meaning women have learned to control their emotions and love who they can get uh, and be more practical uh, about love. But in any case, that whole literature led some people to say that it was men, not women, uh, that are the real romantics. There's an entirely different collection of literature, however, that if you want to believe that it's women that are the romantics, you can pick that. Uh, and that is, if you ask about the emotions associated with love, I'm sick, I can't eat, I have butterflies in my stomach, I'm overwhelmed, all I can do is think about this person, uh, it's that I'm totally incapacitated, you know. Women score much higher on these physiological kind of manifestations of love. Uh, so while they're in it, they seem to feel it more intensely. Okay, so the answer then to that question about who's the most capable of love um, it seems to be a split. Uh, it isn't women obviously falling in love very easily. Both sexes seem to, to be receptive. Um, that's a sampling then of the kind of research you'd do if you were a Shakterian interested in what are the things associated with mind that influence receptivity to love. Let me take the other half now, body, uh, and say, now if you're a Shakterian, what kind of research would you do to say, what are those bodily elements that predispose us to love? What are the things that really stir us up and make us susceptible to, to falling in love? Any questions or observation about all the mind research that, that I've mentioned? Or Okay, let's talk about f the physiological things that, that are exciting. Then I'll give you a sampling of that research, and then, then you can ask some questions. Let's take all the delightful experiences first. Um, to most of us, that makes the most sense. It seems reasonable from any perspective you use that somebody that makes you extremely happy ought to be somebody that you'd love. Um, there's been a lot of feeling, though, that that kind of wildly passionate love that is so much fun is a fantasy. It's based on a daydream of perfection. Sylvia Plath, for example, found that she could only fall in love with fantasy men. She said as soon as she really met them, they weren't at all what she had in mind. Uh, and so she'd keep falling in love with somebody, and then they'd come and ask her out, and she'd say, gee, I thought he was taller or cuter or something, uh, and find she wasn't interested at, at all. Um, well, there is some interesting material that social psychologists have done about love, the fantasy, and I'll tell you three studies. The first was one run by Ellen Burchard, uh at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and Walter Stefan, 
What they wanted to say is that acute deprivation fuels fantasy. Um, and so if you're really sexually deprived, uh, it's very easy to believe that you're going to meet somebody just great pretty soon. What they did uh, in this experiment was invite college men in to meet a computer date. They were supposed to go out that night. And half the time when the men arrived and they all sat in a waiting room, half of the time they had really boring magazines there uh, um, about seagulls and <laughs> other birds. Half the time the waiting room was just littered with these really erotic magazines, uh, Playboy, Viva, um, nudie magazines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what they did then was they came in and they said, the computer has matched you with this girl. Well, it was their prediction that if you were really sexually aroused uh, and deprived when you met this fantasy girl, that you'd distort reality in two ways, that your sort of enthusiasm would give her some sparkle that she didn't really have, and you'd decide two things. One, she was very attractive, much cuter than normally you would think. And secondly, she was much more available than normally you would think. She was a little promiscuous and sexy, et cetera. That's what she indeed got. If you were looking at books on the seagull, you thought she was kind of good looking when you met this, this stimulus person. Um, and you thought she was a regular, normal, fairly straight girl. If, however, you were very sexually aroused, uh, you thought she was quite good looking and quite promiscuous. What I love about this study is it has a morality of another era. There was also a question about how often you expected to see her. And in this condition where men distorted and said she's beautiful and very sexually promiscuous, they also said they'd only date her once because they didn't like girls that weren't nice. <laughs> um, you can, you can uh, get a sampling of that, that logic. Some people have asked then, uh, since love is so much a fantasy, another question I get asked, quite often is about sexual fantasies uh, and what kinds of things are specifically love fantasies or sex fantasies that might affect the kind of person we wanted or, or thought about. It's interesting because this, the things I would have told you three years ago are different than what I'll tell you this year and we have no way of knowing if that's because women have changed or because technology has changed. And, and that's a very interesting thing. It used to be the case when people said, do men and women, are they equally turned on by sexual fantasies? And do they have the same fantasies that you would say no? Kinsey, if you read the original Kinsey report on sexuality and women, he spends a lot of pages explaining why women don't get turned on by pornography. Uh, and sexy, sexy movies, uh, written materials, hardly ever see it, don't get turned on when they do. Um, Kenzie explained that he thinks it's neural. He said there are two possibilities, but one, he just thinks men and women's brains are different. And he gives a lot of pages explaining what is different, precisely the mechanisms in the brain that account for women's lack of receptivity to pornography. The other um, kind of explanation for why this was was that men are aware of their penises from the time they're little kids. Men start having erections about an hour after they're born, we know, and they can feel that. It brushes against their clothes and they learn to associate sexual arousal with a whole variety of, of stimuli. Women lubricate a couple hours after they're born also, but most women are unaware of when they're lubricating. Uh, it, it, it isn't something as noticeable as an erection. So a second explanation the old time guys used to give for why women can't respond to pornography is they're just not aware of, of what their bodies are doing. Well, it wasn't really possible to do much, you see, about research into pornography at the time all these announcements were being made, so we don't have very good data about women in the 50s. When the Commission on Obscenity and Pornography was established, however, they developed techniques not just for asking women, 
are you sexually aroused? But for measuring sexual arousal, they develop the plethysmograph, which on men you put around the penis and when they have an erection, you measure it. Women, it's like little Tampax that you wear and it reflects light. And when women are aroused, you know it. So in all the re recent research, what they've done when showing men and women erotic films is ask them, are you aroused? What they find is a tiny mean difference between the sexes, not at all like you used to get. In the 50s, there was a whopping difference, okay, between the sexes. Now you get a small difference between the sexes with men saying, I'm more aroused. Then you look at the physiological indicators, nothing. Both are registering arousal. What's happening is very interesting. Women are labeling their arousal in one of three ways. Men tend to say, mostly I'm aroused, if you say I'm repulsed. Women are sort of equally split between what I'm feeling is sexual arousal, what I'm feeling is intense anxiety, and I am sexually repulsed. And so they're labeling it in quite different ways, but their bodies are doing something, okay? So recent conclusions now are that the, both sexes can be aroused by pornography, and the differences that we get are content in the films or willingness of women to report arousal. So that's a kind of, kind of research um, that people interested in the types of fantasy are doing. There's one last study on sexual arousal that I'll tell you because uh, I guess I sort of am interested in the, the evolution and the interpretation. Um, for women interested in the women's movement, there's one kind of sexual fantasy that they'd rather people not talk about. Um, and that is that when you ask men what kinds of sexual fantasies do you have, like when you're masturbating or sexually aroused or something, often they talk about fantasies uh, in which they are the dominant person um, generating activity, but they are also being persuaded to do it. The, uh, you've seen those movies, eight college co-eds begged me please, okay? I mean, <laughs> that's sort of the essence of what I'm trying to get at, that this, this man is just uh, propositioned by all the, these ladies. The counterpart sort of that that females have is a lot of females have fantasies about rape, and that is very embarrassing, both personally and ideologically to them, because that is, they would like to be able to daydream about sex, but they don't want it to be their fault, and sort of an uh, overriding theme in all of these fantasies is, I am there as an innocent person. It is not my fault that all of these people force me to do exactly what it is I would like to do. So that the rapes are never women suffering. It is women being sort of driven crazy by this altruistic rapist who does everything that they would sort of like, and the same for men. Uh, so it's interesting that once again the themes of sexuality seem to be more common now than they were thought to be in the past. Okay, lots of research then that fantasies, fun, excitement, uh, security, somebody understanding you, that that can fuel love. I'll finish up the last few minutes now talking about the darker side of love, and that is there's lots of evidence that it isn't just pathological, masochistic people that sometimes get love mixed up with suffering. It's the case that really negative experiences can be interpreted by almost anyone um, as love, and that the two are quite mixed. The reason seems to be, once again, the physiological arousal is so similar in anxiety, frustration, loneliness, that a lot of people can associate that with the longing for love or the loss of love as well as these other experiences. Let me give you a couple of, of examples. And this is the best documented area, I think. 
There's lots of evidence that anxiety and fear sort of set a person up um, for love. Some of the best studies uh, are recent ones that ha are parallel laboratory studies and field studies. So regardless of which kind you like the best, there's, there's evidence from both areas. There's evidence, for example, that if you go into an experiment and they say this experiment has to do with electric shock, and that either you're in a control condition where, thank God, you are never going to get shocked, or else they say you are going to be shocked just short of death, or they say you are going to be shocked short of death, and then they say, oh, whoops, that's a head, isn't it? Yeah, you're not going to be shocked. That's right. You're, so that's sort of a relief group. You know, they got scared and then relieved. Um, they find that somebody who meets a woman under scary or relief circumstances is, finds her a lot more sexually appealing than somebody that meets her under normal circumstances. This is sort of like the observation that in war people are just so receptive to, to love, that sex is mixed up with, with anxiety. There's all sorts of research from the animal literature. Beach has sent me a drawer full of studies uh, about rats, sometimes becoming more sexually responsive with just the right mixture of anxiety. Too much, everybody stops all action, but just a little bit sometimes fuels passionate feelings. Um, there was a field study uh, that has gotten to be quite famous. It was in Playboy and several other people. There was a, a woman who was very good looking and she posed as a reporter interviewing people about the environment. Half of the time she interviewed men after they had walked over a safe concrete bridge. Half the time she interviewed them after they'd sort of crawled over this outward bound bridge and in terror reached the other end. And they just watched to see how many men asked her out for a date. And she got asked out a lot more when men were frightened than, than when they're not. There are also all so sorts of, of studies that have been done by people interested in physiological response, the plethysmograph again. Um, if they show you a frightening movie with people being decapitated and then show you a sexual movie, you have a stronger sexual response than if you just saw the sexual movie. Contrary, if you see the sexy movie first and then the anxiety producing movie, you're more anxious. Uh, this was an accidental finding. They didn't expect that. They expected the opposite. They were looking at notions of um, emotions counteracting one another. And lo and behold, to their surprise, they found all these Schachterian results. And they weren't even familiar with Schachter. And then finally, someone gave them that, that sort of interpretation. There's quite a lot of research then indicating that really negative experiences fuel passion, and that sometimes when we say we love someone in spite of the fact that they cause us suffering, anxiety, and pain, it might be that in some cases we love people because of that, uh, and that it's fueling passion. Okay, I'm going to quit here. I tried to give you a little sampling of how we might organize the some existing research under a Schachterian framework. Why don't you ask questions now, or observations or tell me what you're interested in or something. We can have a little discussion. Okay.